Now I would like to introduce Louise McSorley, who is the Acting Director of Workplace, the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. Uh, it's a statutory body of the Australian Government that was set up in 2012. Now, uh, the body and Louise is charged with promoting and improving gender equality in Australian workplaces, works collaboratively with employers to assist them in improving gender equality. It runs the employer of choice for gender equality citations with 76 organisations being awarded this year. So uh, this is going to give us certainly some great insight into what is happening at a policy level in Australia. Please welcome Louise McSorley. Hello, Louise, how are you? Good, welcome along. Thank you. Um, it's that arsenic in hour in a conference, isn't it, when you all want to go to sleep after lunch and you're thinking, what time can I get away? So I suppose um, to keep you all awake, I'm going to ask you a question about whether or not Lisa Williams this morning talked about the benefits of a diverse work workplace. Uh, she would have talked about gender bias, the business case for why you do this, the moral and ethical uh, reasons, but did, um, and there's lots of men in the audience, so did she say that you do it because of sex? No. Okay, so now you need to stay awake and listen to me, because I'm going to tell you why. And those of you who are tweeting, please do not tweet that yet. I will give you the quote to tweet. Okay, I'm the CEO of the uh, Workplace Gender Equality Agency. We have a brand new data set in Australia. And you're all scientists, so you're all data nerds like me. We lead the world in gender equality statistics, and I'm really excited about that. So we collect data annually from employers in Australia who employ more than 100 people. So basically, it's the big end of town. Those of you here work in the big end of town. We collect your data as well. We collect data on where women work and where men work, what levels they work at and what they get paid. Uh, we have a look at what organisations are doing uh, in, in relation to gender equality. So we are right inside an organisation's culture. And last year was the first year that we took uh, collected data. And so we're actually a data collection agency but also an education agency. And that's why you get to have me here today as part of the sort of education outreach. <clears throat> so I'm gonna take you through the data, the big picture in Australia. And this slide shows you, and I will get to the sex. This slide shows you that uh, basically it's half and half the workforce, things you probably already know. But if you dive into that a little bit more deeply, you'll see that uh, in terms of uh, part-time and casual, you're seeing more women, no surprise there. But that once you move through just from the basic levels, 65% or 64% of the managers are male and 36% are female. So we're starting to see a little bit of a differential there as well. So overall, men earn more, they work more hours and they hold more senior positions. So that's the uh, big picture or the top line. Diving into the next little bit of data. We collect information across a range of indicators. So we start at sort of directors and boards of management. So we ask about your university uh, chancellor and your senate, uh, your council. We ask about your CEO, which would be your vice chancellor. KMPs stands for key management personnel. And then we go through sort of the ranks. Uh, and then at the bottom of this graph, we have uh, the sorts of occupations that we collect data from as well in terms of the non-manager categories. And we've got the industries now, some of the industries that I'll talk about. So the colours, how do the colours work? Well, clearly the yellow is where you've got a high predominance of women. And no surprise, we're stuck in the corner. We're predominantly in my data set, which is one third or 30% of the largest 30% of the workforce, uh, women are found mostly in the lower levels, in clerical and administrative work, community and uh, personal service, so, you know, uh, nurses, uh, and in sales. 
And then as we go through the gradations, you can see women, uh, you know, half and half in the professionals, uh, getting up into the sort of other manager category, but dropping off as we move up the ranks through senior management to being a key management perso uh, person or personnel and then to being a CEO. Uh, it's pretty dark there in chair in terms of the, the top of the, the tree. So not really very many women there and I'll come to those, uh, uh, those statistics. And also in terms of directors, 25% are sort of at the top of the tree are women. If I think about the um, ASX 200, which is probably the pinnacle of corporate achievement in Australia, there are 12 female chairs in the ASX 200. 12? There are 200 companies? We're half the population? How does that work? 20% uh, of board members? How does that work? The math maths don't work. 12% of those boards on the ASX 200 have targets to get more women directors. 12%? Those of you who are contributing to super or buy shares, I'd be asking questions about where your money's going. Well, that's a pretty damning statistic. And here's a little funny one. In the ASX 400, the most popular names for CEOs or chairs are Peter and David. So if your name's Peter and David in this room, you have a bit of a chance. Uh, 26 Peters and 22 Davids. But if your name's Louise, Mc Louise, probably, I think there's probably one, and it's not me. So in summary, what the data tells us that women earn less. Well, the total remuneration pay gap in our data set is 24.7%. That's total REM. So total REM includes your base salary and all those components that go on top, like a bonus and a car and other allowances. Uh, what our data set showed for the first time is that there's actually quite a difference between base salary and total REM for men and women. So we've already got this gender pay gap at the base level for men and women, but it is exacerbated by bonuses. And that would be clear, I think, in universities. Well, Merlin's uh, nodding, yes, or is that yawning? <laughs> Sorry, I haven't got to the sex yet. Um, so 17.9% is the new national gender pay gap, and that's just an average of, you know, men and women's salary dividing. Um, but that overall, and we can talk about data, and I don't want to go into arguments around uh, statistical collections and anomalies. Um, generally, women are underrepresented, as I say. The highest pay gap is in financial services. No surprise there. It's all those Peters and Davids heading up those, those uh, big financial institutions. Uh, let's move into how science compares. Now, this is our data set. So it's not necessarily a University of Australia data set or a broader data set. It covers, in scientific research services, large medical and industry research organisations. Full-time REM gap there, 26%. Women are 61% of the workforce, as you can see, but again, a small percentage of those at the top of the tree. Overrepresented in part-time and casual roles. In higher education generally, in the data set that we have, so we have all higher education uh, institutions with more than 100 uh, staff, the gender pay gap is 17%. 21% uh, of the CEOs are women. 35% of the key management personnel are women. Moving to have a quick look at a, another data set because I'm going to go sort of back and forth. Uh, this is from uh, the higher ed research data set. Um, as you can see, this is probably data you've probably already seen today. Uh, not really, what's happening here is we're seeing women come up and then they're not coming through the pipeline. Um, and I'll talk about reasons for that shortly, which you all probably know, but it's good to have the discussion and draw in a few, uh, draw out a few particularly things of interest. Um, Prem mentioned earlier that I would talk about uh, how this university was uh, tracking against the other universities. I actually didn't bring that graph uh, because um, you need to probably have a look at it. And if those of you who are online right now, it's uh, probably the inter-institutional statistics on gender from Universities Australia. It paints a very damning picture across both academia and uh, professional uh, uh, jobs in uh, not just this university, but uh, quite a lot of Australian 
universities. And there are some who are doing better. And I caveat it, it they are, they're older statistics, but they're the, the, the most up-to-date that we have. Uh, somebody's probably Googling right now. I, was, I did this same talk at Women in Astronomy a couple of weeks ago, and they were right onto it straight away. What is it about women astronomers? Straight on the net. Probably used to sort of, you know, being out there in the ether world. So what's going on with all these statistics? This is what's going on. Women are falling off a cliff. So some of you will probably have experienced this. You graduate, you've got your PhD, you've done your postdoc, you've got this brilliant career ahead of you. You've got all these offers, people are saying to you, you're the next great thing. And then, you know, on the private side, you're thinking it's time to have a baby, you've got the whole personal life settled as well. So five to seven years out, you decide you're going to have a child. And then you have to start to manage how you're going to balance that with a career in, you know, a high-powered career. And you start to look for opportunities to balance that because the workplace doesn't always make it that easy. And so you might move to sort of part-time. There'll be a couple of those meetings that you might miss. There'll be that job opportunity that you say, no, I can't move just yet, or I'm trying to balance a partner's career. And these things all compound over time. And I'm seeing lots of uh, nods around uh, the room. And it's happened to me uh, as well. And so slowly but surely, you're falling uh, behind. Similarly, you don't apply for those jobs because you think that you're not quite ready. But the research tells us that a bloke would. They think differently to us. Men will apply when they've only got 70% of the capability or qualifications. The research tells us that women won't apply until they're confident they've got 100%. So we won't, we, we're different in terms of our appetite for risk, and that applies to personal risk as well. Similarly, we don't ask for opportunities. The behavioural scientists tell us that women aren't, aren't out there asking, but a man will take, a man will take that risk and say, try me, or pay me more, and they'll make the case. But on the other side of that, the people we're asking for those opportunities, the people we're asking for those pay rises, bring gender stereotypes into the decisions and their impressions that they take away from us. So supervisors are also bound by some of those, uh, some call it biases, some I just call it a stereotype. And you probably heard about uh, that this morning. And you heard, I suppose, this morning also the case for why you need to do this because it's ethically and morally right. And for, you know, there's a whole lot of uh, business research around how diverse teams improve performance. And that's true not just in the business world, but in the research world. And we're seeing that increasingly as I see, you know, these citation lists get longer and longer. How, how long are these, some of these research teams now? I saw one with 100 collaborators. Yep, it's amazing. Um, and so Dr Michael Kimmel, I don't know if any of you are familiar with his work, he throws all that aside. He's a researcher from uh, Stony Brook uh, University in the US. And he says, uh, he writes on, he, taught, he researches in, on men and masculinities. He says, put the ethical, put the moral, and put the business case to one side. Make it personal. He says, man, if you get on board this, your kids, you know, if you start to do more around gender equality, it'll mean that you will do more around the house because what's causing this is that women are doing more work outside the workplace than a man. They're doing more work in the home. And our own Bureau of Statistics tells us that women do four hours extra housework than men a week. And so Dr. Ma uh, Dr. Michael Kimmel says, well, men, you have to do more at home because that frees you know, your partner to go up and do some work <clears throat> in the paid workforce and that'll improve her career opportunities. But he says your kids will have less behavioural problems, so this is a benefit for your child. Your kids will be more engaged at school and do better at school if a man does more housework. And if a man does more housework, women say that they're happier in their marriage. So he says that's a good thing, you should do that as well. And for men, men who do more housework report a higher level or higher incidence of sex <laughs> in marriage. So you can all go back to sleep now. And, um, so the quote is, it's not just about, I suppose, 
uh, the business case, the moral and the ethical case. But according to Dr Michael Kimmel, it's about getting more sex. Um, there you go. So making change, let's talk to what you can do. What is the, what is the call to action here? Uh, Lynn mentioned in her presentation uh, a couple of things, and I'll come to those, but it's really about leadership commitment. You've got that from the top. You have to be visible. You have to drive performance through every level of your organisation, and you have to be accountable. So you have to have a strategic approach that links to this leadership commitment. The best companies we're seeing performing in this space are holding their every level of management to account, to account on gender metrics. So just as you are all counting citations and publications, you should be counting your gender metrics as well. And that's what you get rewarded on and promoted on. Should be do, there is no one size fits all here, so every faculty, every university will have a different approach. You should do your own gender pay gap analysis. And this is not just across like-for-like like jobs, this is across your organisation. Have a look at why women are clustered in that corner in your organisation. Is that right? Is it justifiable? Is it the future you want for your institution? Ask those questions and develop an action plan. And focus on quality, flexible jobs for men and women. I mentioned before about why it's in men's interests, but it's from women's, uh, women's interests as well. So it's good to hear about all the initiatives uh, that you're taking, and Lynn mentioned a few, quite a few that um, uh, her, the Walter and Eliza Hall Institute uh, are doing. I have to say, I don't think I'd describe them in the same way that my colleague Elizabeth Broderick would as small, intentional steps. That's a deep, comprehensive and strategic change program, so congratulations uh, to them. And I challenge everyone here in this room to, to follow that lead. So, in summary, there's a couple of things I would say. For women, leave the ladder down. Bring the next woman along behind you. But also include men in that. And for men, try, have a go. Too often men in this space are reluctant to speak for fear of being told that they're sexist. You know, understanding sexism doesn't fit naturally on their skin. They often can't understand what it is we're talking about. Let them try, let them take those baby steps and bring them along, don't belittle them for it. I've got one minute left. And the last thing I'd say is call it out. Uh, General Morrison said that the conduct that you uh, walk past is the conduct you accept. So from today, call it out, don't accept it. You're all scientists. Accept excellence, not bias. Thank you.